Um, my name is Quiva. Um, I'm a student here. Uh, I've worked with grassroots social movements, social justice movements um, in different parts of Latin America and the Arab world for the last 14 years, um, primarily in Palestine, Iraq, and Lebanon. Um, but I also had the privilege when I was quite young, and probably in retrospect um, at 18, not young enough or not old enough to really understand the nuance of a lot of what I was witnessing, um, but of living in Chiapas for a couple of years and in Guatemala and other parts of Latin America. Um, I've been asked today to reflect upon um, an interview, an article um, that, that is contained in the journal. Um, but what I decided to do is to reflect upon a little bit on two, um, because there was one particular one that I felt more resonance with um, than others, even though they're all extremely interesting um, in all of the different nuances and perspectives um, that they articulate. Um, so I'm going to reflect, um, first of all, um, on from imagination to action, building a commons movement from the ground up, um, which is an interview conducted actually by Tom with Julie Ristu and uh, Alexa Bradley, um, and also on the piece by Massimo De, De Angelis, um, which is a piece that having worked in a context of, of social movements, um, I feel has a lot of relevance to the question of building a commons movement from the ground up. Um, we were asked as part of this to, to include a few quotes. Um, so although you have the journals in front of you and this may not be necessary, um, I just pulled a couple out of, of the articles. Um, one of them um, was the piece, the, the interview, and I'm sure Tom can probably do more justice than I can um, as he conducted it, um, but is, is a reflection and a, a distillation, I feel, of the experience of both of these activists um, and community organizers of their process um, of going from a position in which um, the, the language of the commons or commoning um, was something that, that they had to explain um, and really sort of flesh out for people um, to a point where there, it, it seems to have a lot more currency um, and a more instinctual understanding of, of what they've been trying to articulate for years. Um, so they described um, their own interaction. Um, and again, here I'm focusing on the commons and Massimo D'Angelis's sort of thrust, which is one that I feel probably more gravitation towards is of commoning um, as a process. Um, but they. They talk about, um, for them, um, the commons being a less rigid way of thinking about organizing. Um, and both of them, it seemed, from the, the interview came from leftist backgrounds. Um, but they, they, they say the commons felt both practical and visionary. Early in our collaboration, we developed a set of working assumptions, including the idea that reconnecting people to their imagination was necessary in order for people to have a sense of hope. Many of our early collaborations were about tapping into people's almost cellular, cellular memories. Um, and they talk about using the concepts of see, name, and claim as a framework for engagement with communities. Um, and they also, and you can read them yourselves, um, but outline uh, what they would see as commons principles. Um, and I think part of the reason when I was reading this that I felt um, perhaps more resonance with Massimo D'Angelis' article is that, that I felt that some of these, although extremely important, when I was reading them, I thought this should be self-evident, recognizing one's, you know, the humanity of, of, of the other, um, you know, breaking down these, these false sort of constructs of the enclosures that, that we internalize in our relationships with others, um, you know, recognizing the, that, that everyone should have a chance to participate in defining, restoring, creating, managing, leading, governing, and owning anything that is important to the future of the community, that people most affected by critical decisions must be included in the process of making them. And I, to be honest, I felt a certain impatience when I read them because I thought, well, of course. And yet it's not, of course. And, and I think what I took away from the article, the interview, when I actually sat down with it, was that it's not, of course, you know, that, that, that some of these concepts which seem so instinctual and so self-evident, you know, that they're not, you know, they're, they're, not, um, they're not really the language, you know, they're not how people conceptualize. It, it, there isn't a consciousness around, I think, a lot of these concepts in certain parts of the world. Um, and I think that's what they're really getting at. You know, how do you work in a context in which there, there isn't this inherent sense of community, um, where there is the I and not the we, um, you know, where there is so much divide and fear and suspicion between people, um, and in which people really have been colonized and internalized um, a lot of the processes Massimo De Angelis actually refers to it as homo economicus, um, but of, of 
you know, of, of division. Um, so in that context of, of the very specific context in which they're organizing, I felt it had extremely, it, it was very relevant. Um, and one of the things maybe that we could discuss later amongst our smaller groups is some of these principles and how they can translate, you know, into the work that, that we all do. Um, but from a personal perspective, having worked with social justice movements in the global south, um, having worked, you know, with labor rights movements in Egypt and in, in Ghazi, in, in Turkey and Palestine, in other contexts where there, there isn't time, you know, it, it's more urgent. There isn't time to, to sit down with a list and sort of distillate and reflect and have group process. You know, things happen because there is very overt oppression. Um, and marginalization and exploitation, you know, and, and people have to react and organize. And sometimes this process happens the other way around, um, where the action happens and then this process of sort of retrospective reflection uh, and perspective happens. Um, so I think in a way, in a context where we have that time, it's, it's a luxury, you know, to be able to really formulaically, you know, sort of put some sort of framework around what we're talking about. Um, but certainly, I think in contexts, you know, one of them when I was preparing for this that, that really <laughs> had relevance for me um, in, in with what was referred to another, in another one of the articles, which was um, bread and butter and roses and freedom, um, were, for instance, you know, the, the striking textile workers in the Mahal al Qubra zone in Egypt, um, who, despite extreme repression over the years, despite the fact that their trade, independent trade union leaders have been tortured or imprisoned and sometimes assassinated, continue to, to call for which is bread, freedom, and social justice. Um, and that that is, there, through that process of self-organization, of taking over factories, you know, there, there is an understanding of, of the commons, there is an understanding of commoning, and they might not have the vocabulary, you know, and they might not tick all the formulaic boxes, but they're doing it. Um, in the context of the Occupy movement in Gezi Park in Turkey, you know, where if we're talking about embracing the other, you know, more so, I think, than any other Occupy movement in the world, because of the historic institutionalized and societal discrimination against ethnic and religious minorities in Turkey, the divides, the fear, the suspicion, the author authoritarianism, that that movement, you know, in providing a space in which the movement became the camp, which became the collective conversation around collective, not only ownership, but a process, you know, of, of a journey, I think, towards another way of being, um, which if anything within this whole conversation, I think that's what people are really walking towards. It is another way of being. It is, is going through the messy work of horizontalism and getting beyond the ego politics you know, of that, that, that exist within activism to a place you know, where we are embracing the other, not just tolerating, um, but, but doing it with compassion and with the recognition that our collective survival is dependent on that. Um, there's, there's a couple of quotes that I'm going to, to briefly go through, um, and then I was thinking, I'll get to that later, but of maybe a reflection that we could do collectively as a group. Um, but the, the quote that I, I thought was, was quite pertinent in the context of reflecting, as we did last night, on, on Chiapas um, and indigenous movements, not to homogenize or essentialize you know, entire communities, but to recognize if anywhere the leadership is coming from there in all of this process. Um, but this one is, is um, from Massimo, but um, he says, the history and memory of solidarity and mutual aid is everywhere. It is crucial to recover this history, not because we want to go into the past, but because we want to move forward. Recovering our history also implies that we make visible and valorize what is generally invisible, invisible and irrelevant because we see it with the eyes of the colonizer in us, the homo economist that only speaks through efficiency measures and competitive to the other. We need to reclaim the indigenous in us. Every locality, large or small, has a memory and a current practice of an outside of capital that must be made visible, nurtured, sustained, and developed. Commons are everywhere and only on the basis of their boundaries, expansion, evolution, and ultimately struggle vis-a-vis -vis capital that another world is possible since it is eminent to this. Um, what I was thinking today, um, just to put a bit of background to it for folks who aren't from Ireland, um, but today 
um, marks the, the, the 10 year anniversary um, of a very discriminatory constitutional amendment that was made in Ireland um, that denied citizenship to Irish born children. Um, and there is a symbolic event taking place to commemorate that today. So I was thinking in our reflections, maybe, to think about in a European context, because I know there's been a lot of discussion around Irish contexts, around commenting, um, but to think about asylum seekers and migrants in Ireland and the enclosure that they face, whether it's physical in terms of direct provision and deportation, the isolation, the breakdown of that community fabric and structure, um, and also to think about that in a wider context in relation to Europe, in relation to the over 20,000, it's estimated, migrants who have drowned and asylum seekers drowned trying to reach Europe. Um, and I'm going to read a quote um, that I feel is relevant to this um, and tell a, a very brief story. Um, and then what I was thinking, just to go back to the original article, is maybe using the principles uh, on the comments that are outlined in the interview to try and reflect upon some of this. Um, so in relation um, to thinking about asylum seekers, one story just just came to mind when I was walking with this the other day. Um, and it was of, it was an account by a diver um, who last fall, um, when one of the ships went down that was carrying asylum seekers um, and over 200 people drowned, um, a diver, an Italian diver went down um, into the water to, to retrieve the bodies that had been trapped in the hold. Um, and one of them was of, it seems, a 19 year old Eritrean woman um, who had given birth, it looked like, as the ship went down because her baby was still attached by its umbilical cord to her. Um, and the diver described bringing her up and the sense of shame that he felt, um, the sense of shame in the sense that, that he was impotent in, the, in, in terms of, of being able to show any solidarity with a community that he knew um, had so much commonality <coughs> with his. He was also a fisherman. He was part of a fishing community. Um, but to reflect upon the fact that in our name these boundaries and these walls and these enclosures are created. Um, and whether it's in our individual communities on an everyday basis of relating to each other, of commoning, of struggling, um, and to really understand commoning is struggling, um, or whether it's, it's, it's this, this racialized or essentialized other, you know, the, the, the manifestation of it through allowing over 20,000 people to drown and people to have to risk their lives to crawl over walls to try and get into Europe. Um, but to reflect upon that. And lastly, because I've probably gone over time, I have a quote um, which I thought was relevant, although a little bit pessimistic, um, but, but I think that there's a lot of examples throughout the world of hope, um, and that's something that I really brought away from yesterday, a hope in the horizontal, and to stop <coughs> thinking vertically, because I think at this stage there's no room, there's no space for it. You know, we can continue carrying our placards outside of the places of power and hoping that they listen to us, but it's not working. Um, so I, for one, from yesterday, took out, I think, a message that consolidated a lot of what I've been feeling for a very long time, um, in that, that, that the only possibility, reaction, to this injustice that we see is creating the alternatives um, and having the humility to do the hard, hard slog and work of that. Um, but so this is by Robert Jensen, um, but he says, um, perhaps the most radical act today is to speak the truth about a darkening sky and remain committed to organizing, knowing that there is no guarantee we can endure, let alone prevail. The potential power of social movements at this moment in history flows from this commitment to speaking truth. Not truth to power, which is too invested in its delusions to listen, but truth to each other. <laughs>